Blog Talk Radio. Stevie B's Media Production is a part of the Shellcaster Network. The proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ by members of the Churches of Christ. With your host, Stevie R. Butler, you're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to the Gospel Light Radio Show. I'm your host this evening, Stevie R. Butler from the state of North Carolina, with my co-host Glenn McBillion from the state of Texas, Courtney Carruthers from the state of Illinois, Steve Corder from the state of Illinois, Dr. Frank Washington from the state of Florida, Clay Phillips from the state of Georgia, Brian Christian Coleman from the state of New Jersey, Robert Lee Johnson from the state of Florida, and our newest co-host, John Rowe from the state of of Arizona. We are just grateful that you are tuning into our radio broadcast this evening. This radio show is brought to you by loving and faithful members of the Churches of Christ, and we would ask that you would take out your Bibles and study along with us. We have a very exciting show planned for your spiritual enlightenment and your edification. If you'd like to contact us while we're on the air this evening, just give me a call to the live show at 713-955-0508. Or you can go to the Blog Talk Radio website and listen to the show live there. We're on page number two. I just checked the website. There are over 1,700 live shows that are on the air at this hour, and you will find this this show consistently on pages one through four of that website. What a blessing. And ladies and gentlemen, you can also, if you have any questions or comments for any of my co-hosts, from anything that you hear on this broadcast, you can send your emails to my new email address, butlersteve1009 at yahoo.com. Or you can give me a call, Stevie B, Media Production at the Carolina Studio at 910-491-6405. Now, again, this program is brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ. And if you need any assistance in locating a congregation in your area, please feel free to contact us. Now, folks, get out your Bibles and study along with us here on the Gospel Light Radio Show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Before we go into our program for this evening, I would ask that you would bow with me in a word of prayer that we may thank God for this opportunity. Our most kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, the Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to go through the various activities of the day and placing it on our hearts that we are on this broadcast and we're prepared now to present a portion of your holy and divine word. Father, we pray that you will be with our speakers on the show this evening, Courtney Carruthers and Dr. Frank Washington, as they break into our listeners the bread of life, and also my co-host Clay Phillips, who will be answering our questions that are on the hearts of so many. We just pray that you will bless them and their families that support their efforts, that they may continue to sow the seed of the kingdom. Father, we pray that you'll bless our listeners who are tuning in via Blog Talk Radio as well as through social media. We pray that they may listen well and that their hearts may be pricked as they consider their eternal stance before you and their soul's salvation. And it will cause them to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Father, we thank you so much for sending the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to die such a cruel death on Calvary's cross. We recognize that without such a sacrifice, we will not have a hope of eternal life. All even now, we ask you to forgive us for the transgressions of our own heart. We know our flesh is weak, and we often fall short of thy will. For we pray that you will continue to bless us and keep us and love us all the days of our lives, and that we have been faithful until death. For we pray that you will save us. For us in Christ's name, we do ask it all. Amen. 
You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to the broadcast. Our speakers for this evening in the first segment will be Courtney Carruthers. He serves with the Colonial Village Church of Christ there in Chicago, Illinois. He'll be making his proclamation of the Gospel of Christ. And in the second segment, I have a question from my co-host, Clay Phillips. He serves as the evangelist for the Rose City Church of Christ there in Thomasville, Georgia. He'll be answering our shouted out question. And then to close out the show, my co-host, Dr. Frank Washington, he serves the West Broward Church of Christ there in Plantation, Florida. He'll be making this proclamation of the gospel of Christ to close out the show. So open up your Bibles now and open your minds and let's have a great show. After the break, the next one should be that of my co-host, Courtney Carruthers. Enjoy the show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Give your attention to the proclamation of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, my co host, Courtney Carruthers, and his subject, It Must Be the Atmosphere. Good evening, and thank you, Brother Stevie, for the opportunity to come on this program to speak to the listening audience. And we thank you for your audience for being consistent in being a part of this program 
uh, learning and studying God's Word together. And that's what we're here for this evening, to study and to know what the, by studying to know what thus saith the Lord as we strive to bring clarity as to how man can be saved, remain saved, and then be an example of his salvation to those who do not know Jesus. Uh, we do recognize that we, as the psalm listed, that we are to be a light. For Satan has, Satan has blinded the minds of many people, and it's up to us as members of God's kingdom, the church, to open the minds of those who've been blind, whose minds are been darkened so that they cannot believe the truth. And it's our goal and our hope tonight, our hope and our goal to reveal the truth as simplistic as we can so that men and women may ask that question that was asked over 3,000, 2,000 years ago. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter respond, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. With that said, then, I'll begin with the subject. Uh, it must be the atmosphere out of 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 6. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 6, our Bible says, Now, spirit, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man may say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. But there are diversities of operation, but it is the same God which worketh all in all, that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, to profit with all. We get our subject uh, from that, from the thought of Paul in verse 7, which is to profit, which says to profit with all in order for anything to be a benefit to the kingdom of God, the people of God. There must be an atmosphere that is conducive for people to profit from the gifts of the Spirit. So when we talk about it must be the atmosphere, Merriam-Webster Collegiate Dictionary, 10th edition, footnote 3, explains that atmosphere means a surrounding influence or environment. It is within the scope of this atmospheric series coming out of 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 31, that God's people of today will be able to spiritually visualize the vocational opportunities that are afforded to every member by the Spirit of God to perform productively within the guidelines for serving according to Acts chapter 6, verse 3, Romans chapter 12, 1 through 2, Romans 12, 9 through 15, and Romans um, 15, verses 5 through 13. And the grace to serve according to 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 9, 1 Corinthians 4, 11 through 13, 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 14. Allow me, if you will, just to read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, where Paul addresses the church in regarding, uh, regarding, <clears throat> excuse me, regarding, um, Their, their their purpose as ministers and their purpose in bringing understanding to the Corinthians as to their walk with Jesus or the unity that churches 
are not to be unified by the men they follow because man did not die for us. Paul, the, the church were divided over men. They were, that is at Corinth, they were saying, well, I'm a Paul, I'm a Cephas, and I am Christ. Then Paul addresses this in verse 5. In 1 Corinthians 3, 5, he says, uh, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos but servants or ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have a planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, whether is whether so then neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now, he that planted and he that watereth are one. That's the key word there. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry, and you are God's building. So when we talk about it, it must be the atmosphere. The first thing we want to understand that atmosphere is a surrounding influence or environment. What is in the church that inspires or influences us to act like God? It cannot be the one who water or plant it. It's God giving man the ability through the spirit to operate. All right. Well, the question will come that comes to my mind in looking at this thought tonight. It must be the atmosphere. Why, then, are people so misled by the functionality of the Spirit or the purpose of the Spirit or the gift of the Spirit or gifts of the Spirit? The Spirit itself is a gift. It is a sign, a signet, a seal that says we are, that we belong to Jesus Christ. That's the gift. But then the gift is the influence that is in us, the operation that comes in us to perform according to the way God will have us to perform or carry out ministry. To carry out ministry, one must be in Jesus Christ. To be in Jesus Christ, as you have heard over and over again, we all preach the same thing, speak where the Bible speak, and our silent where the Bible silent. It's still no different today because the Bible has not changed, that to be one in Christ, or one with the Lord, one must become his child. To become his child, one must, the seed of salvation must be planted into the heart of man. When the seed of salvation is planted in the heart of man, they are impregnated with the spirit of God, or they are impregnated. And with the ability that says, or the mind that says, like the eunuch said, what must I do to be saved? The eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Then Philip said, well, the eunuch said, see, here's water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, you believe with all thy heart thou mayest. Now to be born into the family of God and to receive the gifts of God, to operate, con co to operate cooperatively for God, one must be his child. To become a child of God, one must, go, one must have the seed planted, and they must break water. As a baby is ready to be born, they break water from the womb, and they are born into the family. One cannot say they have the spirit of God and have not broken water that puts them into the family of God. The Bible says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The Bible also says in Acts 17, what, now why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized. Or what are you waiting on? Arise and be baptized. Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says it this way. Well, even Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Being one with Christ means to be in his family, which is called Christian. Um, being Christian, to be a called child Christian, one must be in the faith of God, the family of God. The faith of God or the family of God uh, the word faith, as we're talking, is in relation to saying we respond to the requirement of God. 
faith is our response to what God requires. What does God require to have the spirit? As we'll get back to First Corinthians, he requires that we make Jesus our Savior. And when we make Jesus our Savior, we are put into the kingdom of God, the atmosphere of God. And as we have the atmosphere of God influenced by God's word, influenced by the spirit, we as the church, the community of the kingdom, go out and we bring people in by what's in us. That is the spirit of God. Well, how do we do it? Well, first of all, we mention several scriptures. Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Romans chapter 12, 1 through 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, so the situation at the time of Paul's writing was not to primarily speak about the showcase of gifts, but to speak primarily about the, about the spiritual fascination of gifts, the spiritual fascination of gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Now, only the spiritual fascination of gifts, but the spiritual functions of gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 through 11. The spiritual functions of gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. The spiritual fit of gifts, fit, F-I-T of gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 to 21. Then the spiritual fellowship of gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 22 to 31. Once again, the spiritual fascination of gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 to 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 1. The spiritual functions of gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. Spiritual fit of gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 21. And then also the spiritual fellowship of gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 22 to 31. This outline serves as the door key to unlock the specifics of Paul's concern throughout chapter 12. The foundational concern centers around the major motives for having a peaceful ministry, a positive reason that propels the participants in the church to be productive. This is detailed in 1 Corinthians 14.40. Let all things be done decently and in order. The idea of order, let it be done in arrangement. Don't everyone start using their gifts in a, in a confused manner. The immediate thought of this verse implores the churches in Corinth, the church in Corinth and the churches of today to have a scheme, a blueprint, a proper management for conducting the worship of God efficiently and ministries effectively. The thought is achievable as long as the attitudes within the organization of the church conforms to the atmosphere of the spirit within the principal guidelines of the spirit environment. According to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, where the Bible says these words, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3. The Bible says, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto thee to edification and exhortation and comfort. But he that, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. That he that, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now, you'll notice that many people will marvelize themselves or marvel over speaking in tongues. Speaking, the word, as you look at the King James Version, talks about unknown tongues. And you'll notice that the word unknown is italicized. It emphasizes, it to emphasize that there were so many tongues that they couldn't, could not put all the names of the, of the languages in the Bible. So, as one may say, I got the gift of the Spirit, so I speak in tongues, they're not, no, that's not what Paul is talking about. He is talking about having a gift given by the portion of the Spirit in people to edify the church, to build up the church. If one comes speaking in their own language, he's only speaking to himself. When the apostles spoke, use tongues, the Bible describes for us, described for us, the various kinds of tongues that were present, Elamite, Cyrene, um, those scattered throughout Asia, uh, Cappadocia, Bithynia, all around. There was not an unknown tongue. And they said, how do we hear the wonderful works of God in our own language? Are these men drunk? 
So tongues or gifts, one of the gifts is tongues, speaking in tongues, were to edify the church. Now, in worship, however, we have gifts of singing. I have heard people say, well, why not let the people, our young men and women play instrumental music in worship? That's the gift. You can play your instrumental music any way you want, but when it comes to worshiping God, everyone that has breath must praise God through the accompaniment of the spirit, not the accompaniment of a piano or a guitar or a drum. The Bible says, speaking to yourselves in Psalms, him, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse um, 519, speaking to yourselves in Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. When we talk, when we emphasize spiritual songs, we emphasize a song that is different from the sound and processing of the world, how the world process receiving music. The music we use ought to be different from the world. It is to be spiritual, set apart. The instrument we use to glorify God, it is, is our heart. It is the organ that propels, that is, it, is it is the organ that uh, 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 propels the blood to flow through the stream. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is the spirit of God that goes into our ability to worship God in spirit and in truth, John 4:24. So we talk about the atmosphere in this sense. We say that the thought is achievable according to 1 Corinthians 14, 3. But he that prophesies is speaking unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. This is precisely why our subject inspires us to recognize the purpose of being gifted and not to battle about what gift is better. It must be the atmosphere. However, the result of an atmosphere starts with an attitude that promotes an environmental climate within the church organization to operate in unity that the Spirit of God governs. It is impossible to discuss the body without discussing the ministry, to discuss the ministry without discussing the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Spirit inspires unity. The Spirit inspires initiates diversity. And the Spirit um, the Spirit brings about maturity. So when you look at this, the outline says this, the spirit inspires unity. There is, when we talk about unity, we mentioned it from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 to 13, but let's just point out without going through the whole gist of it. Verse 1 says, now concerning spiritual unity, uh, concerning spiritual gifts, brother, I would not have you ignorant. Verse 3 says, wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God, calleth Jesus a curse, anathema, that no man may say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. Then he says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Verse 5, now there are diversities of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operation. But it's the same God which worketh all in all. Let me put it this way. Let's put it this way. Every apostle whom God called that have seen the resurrection of the Lord, that were at the baptism of John and have seen the resurrection of the Lord, were sent by the same spirit, spoke by the same source, and saved by the same source. All right, for example, Acts chapter 2, all the apostles were sent by the same spirit. They spoke about the same thing, that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all men. He is the King of kings, Lord of lords. He is the resurrection. That those who heard this, they all, the apostles, they, the, those who were pricked in their hearts said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They all said the same thing, Peter and the apostles, repent and Peter, that is, repent and be baptized. The same thing that Peter spoke, 
we find the Ethiopian eunuch saying the same thing. Because we know he must have spoken about water to be saved because the eunuch says, see, here's water. If Jesus cannot have a child because he's cut off, then I'll become his child because I too was cut off. I identify myself with Jesus because I've been cut off just like Jesus has been cut off, but he don't have to be cut off anymore because I'll become his child. How do I become born again? I become born again by the source that Philip spoke about, the source that Peter spoke about, which is through water, which is the water baptism. All right? When they went down to the water baptism, the unit went on his way rejoicing. Not only that, but we find Ananias. We find Philip, I mean, Paul, Saul, himself being baptized. The the, the um, Cornelius and his household were too baptized. Even, even Peter said, can any man forbid water that these might be saved? All right, so there is, there is spiritual unity. The Spirit inspires unity. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 5 mentions this. Romans 12, 1 through 5 states this. Romans 12, we'll start at verse 2. Romans 12, verse 2. The Bible says these words, Romans 12, in verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may be, that ye may be, be, be may, that ye may prove what is good, that is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more higher than he ought to think, but to think soberly according to God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. But we have many members in one body. We have many members in one body. We already know from past teaching on this station or on the show or on this Bible study that one body represents the church. We're all baptized into one body, First Corinthians 12, 12, by one spirit. That to receive the gift, one must be in the body of Christ. When you receive the gift, it's not a miraculous thing or a thing that we, nobody understands, but it's to edify individuals. Let's talk about the spirit initiates diversity. Just like our body has eyes, mouth, nose, hands, arms, but it's still connected to one body. So is the body of Christ called the church of Christ. We all are members of the body. That's why we all sing. We take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, not every first and third Sunday. According to the great Gregorian calendar, our first Sunday is the first day of the week. All the churches of Christ do that. You cannot find anywhere in the Bible where it says take it outside of the first day of the week. We all not only sing without instrumental music. We, not only, we also take the Lord's Supper. We also baptize in the name of Jesus. We pray. We, so, but the gift. The, the spirit initiates diversity, which the hand, the arms, is to help keep the body healthy, edified, and strong. So let me close it out this way. When the church is here, what the spirit is saying to the church, then there will be more cooperation in the church than carnality. There will be more cooperation in the church than confusion. God is not the author of confusion when we hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There'll be more cooperation in the church than carnality. There'll be more cooperation in the church than confusion. There'll be more cooperation in the church than competition. There'll be more cooperation in the church than cliques. There'll be more cooperation in the church than conflict. For after all, a spiritual environment in, enriches the lives of God's people by properly enhancing an atmosphere that accelerates the climate towards a behavioral balance within the church that affects everyone within to have a positive attitude. We are living in a world today, this war, Russia and Ukraine, the Congress and the Senate, uh, many things that's going, shooting in the schools, death, death in, our, in our homes. So much is happening, jobs, the high inflation, it's hard to live without Jesus assuring us through his word that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. 
It's hard to live also without the spirit of God in our lives, the paraclete being the comfort of our spirit. The word para means to draw near. The word cleat means to call. Every day you wake up and walk, you need to call on God. Every day you come home and go to sleep, you need to call on God to comfort. In times such as these, it's hard to live without the spirit of God who gives us a peaceful assembly. We don't go to church to fight over gifts. We come to church to be edified over the gifts because it's a peaceful assembly. And we have a promising assurance that the Spirit of God knoweth those who are his. Jesus knows who, he, who we are. We ought to work to uplift people. We ought to work in the church to uplift God as a blood-stained banner to call people from a dark day to a, to a lively day, to call people out of difficulties so they can be delivered to a, a state of peacefulness. And that's what the church does through singing. That's what the church does through prayer. That's what the church does to the Lord's body. For the same God that raised Jesus up, he'll also raise us up. Because every time there's a Monday misery, a Tuesday trial, a Wednesday worthlessness, a Thursday tribulation, a Friday frustration, a Saturday setback, the following week we have a Sunday, we have a Sunday strength, a Monday of mercy, a Tuesday of thanksgiving, a Wednesday of worthiness, a Thursday of, of thankfulness, a Friday of faith to say it's the same faith I woke up with, it's the same faith I'll go down and I'll sleep tonight that the Lord will be by my side. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's, he's a bridge over troubled water. He's my leading post in the wilderness. He's my shepherd that have never lost a sheep. He's my doctor that have never lost a patient. He's my, he's my peace be still in the storm. And you need that kind of Savior. To have that Savior, to have Jesus as your Savior in your life, you must repent, confess, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you, and may he bless you real well. Thank you. And if you miss me from singing, singing, and you can't find me nowhere, nowhere. come on up to glory. glory. I'll be singing the fair. Yes, I will. And I know the Lord, He will greet me over yonder. Jesus! 
You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Shout it out question. Ladies and gentlemen, I seem to be having some technical difficulty here, but this is the portion of the broadcast where we have my shouted out question from my social media platform on Facebook. I'm going to pose this question to one of my co-hosts, uh, Clay Phillips from the Rose City Church of Christ there in Thomasville, Georgia. And we also want to encourage our listeners to go on Facebook if you're on that Facebook uh, so platform and get involved in those biblical discussions in that shouted out group. Hey, uh, Clay, how you doing, my brother? Marvelous, my friend. How about yourself? I'm doing just fine. Now, we have a doozy of a question for you tonight. Now, okay. this now these series of questions come from uh, Gerald Williams from Amarillo, Texas, and his question is in regards to a preacher named Gino uh, Pastor Gino Jennings, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar uh, with this man at all. You ever heard of him? I have, I have heard of him. Okay. I, I, I'm not sure. Didn't uh, Dr. Jack Evans debate him one time? Uh, no, he made his uh, co-worker. He, the guy oh, okay. that was older than him. Oh, okay. But he has some great questions here uh, in regards to some teachings of Pastor Gino Jennings, and this is the questions that he has, or the concerns that he has concerning the teachings of Gino Jennings. He says, now, uh, Gino Jennings says these things, these are some of his teachings, that the Holy Spirit is not a person but just God's spirit. And number two, God is not three personalities, but God is not um, schizophrenic. Then he says, number three, there is no trinity, and the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but is rather a concept invented by the Catholics. And then he said, number four, to say that there is Father, Son, Holy Spirit is the same as saying that there are three gods. Now, what say you to these uh, contentions that Gino Jennings has regarding the Holy Spirit? Thank you very much, Brother Steve. And those that are listening on this evening, it is good to be able to come into your homes or by radio or those that are watching by Facebook. I just uh, thank God that we have uh, the opportunity to share with you. The Bible teaches us that we have to be prepared to answer questions that are asked. And some questions are good questions, some questions are bad questions, but uh, I think that it is uh, good that we uh, answer the questions uh, live on uh, the radio as well as by way of Facebook. Now, if you have your Bible, turn with me to first, because I got about 20 minutes to answer this particular question, and uh, it, it, it won't take me long in that, but I'm just going to hit the high spot and uh, show you what uh, the Bible teaches about the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, uh, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. That is true. The word Trinity is not found in the Bible. Uh, uh, my name is not found in the Bible, but I'm a, a Christian. Uh, so we must understand as we struggle to ask a question, we must be mindful. First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2, teaches us that none of us know as we ought to know. So this is one of those questions that uh, whether you know it or not, you must. You better be right. <laughs> you better be a part of Christ because it, whether you know the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or you think there's one God, or whatever. But that God, we must. We better know Him. We better know God of God and Lord of Lord. So now, uh, let me let me read a scripture. First John chapter five and verse number seven. The Bible says, uh, "For there are three that bears record in heaven: the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost." Or the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Now, that is not in the Bible. In the original Greek, that verse is not there. So just, just, just I'm not telling you. Now, why they put it there? They put it there to help us uh, get a grip on understanding uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. But verse 7, listen to me, verse 7 of 1 John chapter 5, 
uh, Jenny is right. That verse is not in the original text. Let me read it again. For there are three that bears record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, is not in the original text. Now, most scholars will agree with that. As, as so I did, Brother Evans, Dr. Evans, when I was at Southwestern Christian College, and Brother Maxwell uh, debated men in dealing with this particular same question. Uh, but it does not, listen to me now, does not, it does not omit, listen, because this verse is not in the Bible. We have an, a, enough in the Bible to justify or to lead us to the teaching that there is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So if we omit this verse, it does not affect, listen to me, it does not affect the teaching at all about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, there are three homiletics I want to look at. I'm not going to be able to deal with all of it, but I'm going to just give it to you. I'm going to look at number one, the Godhead deity. The Godhead deity uh, confusion of the Godhead and the misconstruedness of the Godhead. We're going to look at what people will say and think and how they look at the Bible. So number one, we're going to look at that. The first target is the Godhead, the, the, the confusion and the misconstruedness of individuals. Number two, we're going to notice uh, and understand the one God concept, the one God concept. We need to understand that, the one God concept. And then number three, we're going to look at the, the historical or the historicity of uh, the expression of God, uh, what is called the dichotomy, uh, uh, the di dichotomy of it. So we want to look now, if you will, let us get a, a grip of understanding. First of all, what do we know for sure? <laughs> now, what do we know for sure? This is the answer. This is what we need to focus on. What do we know for sure? Now, when you stand before God at the judgment, understand, none of us are going to know everything. Nobody knows everything in the Bible. None of us, this thing about the, the Holy Spirit, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is perplexing to everybody. I don't care whoever he is or she is that teach this, none of us know everything about God. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. We don't know everything. Thank God we have enough Bible to help us appreciate that, listen, that there is a God. <laughs> One thing I do know and believe in my heart that there is a God. Now, uh, let, let me say this. Let me say this. Uh, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, uh, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabbatana. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Why has thou forsaken me? The centurion that was there, he said, uh, after after." Darkness came. The Bible says dead people got up and walked. <laughs> now, I don't know how much God you need to know, but none of us, when we die, they're going to bring up, dead folks going to get up. Darkness going to be like thick water. Uh, none of us are going to be like that. So I know I'm not God. <laughs> and I'm not going to pretend to be God, but one thing I do know, Jesus, the Bible says that he said, Eli, Eli, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? So here we find that even the centurion had enough wisdom, enough God. One of the soldiers stood up there when Jesus died and earthquake shook. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what you want about God, but <laughs> God is Jesus something else. He, he, he's not us. Uh, we not he's not us. He is a duality. He 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 came in this world to live like us. 
but he's not us, and, and, and we are not him, but uh, he says, why have thou been saved? And the centurion, now listen to this. The centurion said, uh, truly, this was the Son of God. <laughs> he said, I, I don't know about y'all, but uh, if he, Jesus walked on the water, did you believe that? He took five loaves of bread and two fish and fed 5,000. Do you believe that? <laughs> Woo! Went to a grave and a young man named Lazarus was dead. The Bible says, he said, Lazarus, come forth. Do you believe that? Now, do you believe in the Bible? Because if you read from Matthew to Revelation, that it blows your mind. How this Jesus that People are arguing about and trying to say he's not God. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you about that. I'm not going to debate you on that. I'm, what do we really know? What we sh- sure are is that he ain't nothing to play with. <laughs> Woo! He ain't, he ain't nothing to play with. Now, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 19 and 15, says uh, let, let everything be by the witness or uh, at least three witnesses, out of the mouths of three witnesses, that every matter shall be established. Let, let us start with some witnesses first. Before I, before I even get into the, the confusion and the misconstruedness of God, let me, if you will, look at three witnesses of the God of Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to 17, that Jesus went to John, John the Baptist, uh, it, it was already prophesied that John the Baptist, called us Elijah, was going to come and make way, Jesus way straight. This is Jesus now. Now, I don't know what you want to call him, but I'm calling him Jesus, my Lord, <laughs> my God. You can, be, you can call him whatever you want to call him, but I'm going to call him my Lord, my God. Bible says that uh, John even said Ah, Jesus baptized me, John. John, so here's the water, the, the confession. God is going to confess and say that here is his son. You better hear me up in here. Mm-hmm. Bible says, Jesus has baptized me. John said, no, I, you need to baptize me. Jesus said, no, what you got to do is you got to baptize me. Why? Because we have to fulfill all righteousness. <laughs> I love it. You got to fulfill all righteousness. You are about whether he's God or not. John says, you, John recognized him. And John even got prepared sometimes uh, when John was in prison. You remember? John was in prison. John said, now, are you the one or should we look for another one? <laughs> John was complex. He said, are you the one or should we look for another one? Jesus said, baptize me, John. He went down in the water. Now, notice now, the Bible says that uh, it's the spirit of God, like a dove, and there's a voice from heaven, the first witness, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, you can talk to his daddy when you, when you die. <laughs> you explain to his daddy when he dies. Uh, we don't understand all this. We don't understand all the Bible. We don't understand everything in the Bible, but one thing I do know, that I'm not God, and I need God. And, and all this stuff in the Bible, you, you, you want to argue about, you can find something else to argue about. Then, then not, only, not only the water baptism, not only the water baptism uh, justify a witness, then the, the blood, the water was the baptism, then the blood, according to John chapter 12, verse 28, the Bible says, John, Jesus said, Father, glorify me. And the Father spoke from heaven and said, I, you glorified me. <laughs> Whatever Jesus, you, when Jesus said, Lord, it is, he said, it is finished. Father, I, I hope I glorified you. He said, you did. Don't you worry about them jokers they're talking about. They don't believe you, God. Don't worry about them. You, you come on home. <laughs> and, and the Bible says, that uh, he, he went on back to heaven uh, uh, and sat down on the 
right side of his body. No, no, no. What you going to do with all that? Hello? No, no, no. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Not only the Bible says the voice came from heaven and said, I, I have, you have glorified me. Read John chapter 12, verse 28. Then the spirit, the comforter, glorified him. Witness. So you got three witnesses here. The comforter in, in John 15, verse 26 and 27, it testified that the comforter, Jesus said, let, let me read that. That, that, that. That's some good stuff right there. John chapter, about to turn about John chapter 15, and I just got to read that one. John 15 and the verses 26. John 15, 26. And we find these words. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth. You know what I'm saying? Hey, he's not lying. The spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. Jesus said, he, that the spirit will testify of me. The water testified of me. My blood testified of me because the blood sacrifice had to be done. Couldn't nobody else do it? All of these years, could nobody do it. Goats and bulls and goats could not redeem man. You say, I'm going to send my son. And if you don't want to be that, that's fine. You, you, you got to explain that to God by his son. Then it says, he shall testify me, verse 27, and ye also shall bear witness, <laughs> because ye have been with me from the beginning. Now, let's, let's listen to uh, the doctrinal issue. Let's listen to the doctrinal statement. Uh, the Godhead, listen, listen. The Godhead, and I got about 10 minutes. Y'all bear with me, okay? The Godhead, the, the deity, the confusion, the misconstruedness of individuals. Now, now, they have a proof text. Let, let me give you the proof text that they try to prove that uh, Jesus is not God. Turn your Bibles now to Colossians. Everybody turn to Colossians chapter 2. And uh, the verse is number 9. This is where we go to try to prove the proof text. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 9. All right. Colossians 2, verse number 9. Uh, Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? This is what it says. It says, For in him there is all the fullness of the Godhead. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead and body. Now, this is their proof text to try to say Jesus Christ was not God. Why do they say? Why they say? Because they're saying that Jesus, he is the Father. Jesus, he is the Son. Jesus, he is the Holy Spirit. This is the Jesus only mentality. This is the confusion that is going on that Jesus is the Father, that Jesus is the Spirit, and that Jesus is the Son. That he's all of them, the, the body head, if we will. Now, Understand this. Christ was God in the flesh and reflected the attributes of God. In other words, when Jesus came, he was God in the flesh. God stuck down to our level. <laughs> now, 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 I don't know about your God, but my God loved me because the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I don't know who your God is, and I really don't care, because he can't do nothing that my God cannot justify. <laughs> Let the Bible speak, Brother Philip. Jesus Christ, understand this, Jesus Christ came to demonstrate the character and the work of God. What is the character of God? Now, I, I told you I'm not going to finish this, but I, I'm not trying to finish. I'm trying to make sure you got the point. Turn to John chapter 10 and verse 22. John chapter 10 and the verse is number 22. We find these words written. And it was at Jerusalem, the day, feast of dedication. And it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon. 
porch. In other words, the, the Bible had already prophesied that when he comes, that he's going to be greater than Sodom. So Jesus said, let me walk on the porch. And then the Bible said, now notice now how it said, then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, how long does thou make us to die? <laughs> they died. Even then they died. Don't you know that's why they killed the brother? Our brother, that's why they killed him. Because they died it, that he was God. The Bible says, how long should thou make us die? If thou be the Christ, tell us plain. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The work of, uh, notice what it says, the work that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. In other words, if you don't know that I'm God, you, what, what, what's, what's wrong with you? If you if you can't recognize I'm not Jack y'all, I'm, I'm I'm in the image of, of of you all. I can't be you, but I'm I'm more than just man. You 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 ain't recognize that that I'm more than man. Some, somewhere in the Bible, you ought to say well, Jesus was totally different than anybody else. God, if he ain't your God. Uh, maybe, maybe that ring on your finger is your God. Maybe the idolatry, worshiping false God, is your God. The Bible says uh, that in the Old Testament, they uh, called uh, images and uh, idols their God, and they had to carry them around. But Jesus, the disciple was on the water, and there was a storm, and he came, and he told the water to stop. Raising the wind to stop blowing, and then and the apostle said, "That got to be God." <laughs> well, look at this. He got to be God. And the Bible says in verse twenty-six, "But ye believe not, because ye are not. Listen now, listen. That you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. What do you say? My sheep hear my voice." I know them, and they follow me. I gave unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man put them out of my hand. But notice in verse number 26, my Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. He said, notice said, I and my Father are one. <laughs> You better hear this up in here. That's my daddy. Uh, now, now understand, the Bible says in John chapter 4 and verse 24, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So Jesus, I want y'all to know, my, uh, uh, my God is a spirit. So when you look at God, you can't look at God from the eyes of man. The, he, he, he's greater than us. He's better than, than anything we can imagine. The Father glorified the Son. The Apostle Paul, in the Hebrew writer, helped us out as well. Let's see what Paul says, and then we'll go to the Hebrew writer. I got five minutes. Uh, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, everybody turn the Bible now to 1 Corinthians, the chapter is 4, and uh, verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and the verse is number 4. Everybody turn the Bible now to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In whom the God, small g, of this world have blind the minds of them which believe not. If you don't believe that he's God, the, the devil have blinded you. No one said, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine around you. You better hear this. You better understand this. You better catch on to this. Then, then in Hebrews, turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, and verse 1. God. <laughs> now, now, I don't have time to deal with that God tonight, but uh, we're going to complete this thing one day. God, who at sundry times and in divers manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in the last day, you better hear this, has in the last day spoken unto us by his son. If God called him his son, you're going to say he's not? What? Ha, you got some nerve 
to say that he's not God's son. And whom, this said, who, whom he have appointed have all things, by whom also he made the world, who been in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholded it all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sin, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And you saying he's not God? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Look at the witness here. Being made so much better than the angels as he have inherited, obtained a more excellent name than they. So let's understand the one God concept. We need the one God concept. If you can understand the husband and wife concept, you can understand the one God concept. The husband and wife, when you get married, you become one. Hello? If you can understand the husband and the wife concept, you can understand the uh, God, the word God in the text in, 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 in Genesis, God is a compound word. It is not an absolute. Like when you remember when God told uh, Abraham, take your only son. That is an absolute. That's the only son he had. And you remember uh, the, the, uh, the prophet that, that that he told God, he says, he says, I, 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 whoever come out the door first, and his daughter came out, just died, and his daughter came out, he sacrificed his only daughter. Now, these words are only. So now, in other words, the Hebrew word is ekhid. Ekhid is to unify or to join together. So in Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Lord our God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So if you're going to understand the husband and the wife concept, you're going to understand that. If you're going to understand that in the day, in, in, in Zechariah 14, 9, I'm going to try to read it. In the day, the Bible says, the Zechariah says, in that day shall Jehovah be one. The one there is speaking of the unity or the joining together of ego, the Hebrew word. Then if you look at uh, uh, yeki, yeki is a word, the Hebrew word that signified that uh, Abraham sacrificed his own son, yeki. Now, let, let's look at the wisdom. Let me wrap this up. Let me wrap this up. I got to wrap it up. I got to wrap it up. The word God is a divine nature. It is a, a nature. It is, it is, listen, we, you, you can't understand everything. You're not supposed to understand everything. You're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. The God, the Father, in John 3, 16, God the Son in John chapter 1, verse 1. The Holy Spirit in Acts 5, 3, 4, talked about Ananias and Sapphira. The Old Testament gives us the name Elohim, which is in, in Genesis. And I got to I I I I stop, but I, I got to stop for real. In Genesis, everybody now turn about to Genesis, and I'm going to let this be yours. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and God said, now, now cast this, and God said, let us, what? Let us make man in our image, in our image, us, ours, and our likeness. I'm just speaking, Brother Clay Phillip. Remember this? Keep it real. Shout it out question. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Is your congregation in need of lending for a building or expansion project? As your partner and advocate, Diversified Financial Network will take the time to understand your unique situation and develop a financing solution that meets your specific need. It's an exciting time for your congregation, and what you need is a company with expertise in church financing early in the process. Call us today 
at 1-866-513-6665 or visit us at www.diversifiedfinancegroup.com. This is a program reminder. Stevie B's Media Production presents. We're airing live shows here on Blog Talk Radio. You can give a call to the live show at 713-955-0508 or type in your search bar at www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash gospel light radio show. Or you can just type in your browser, Blog Talk Radio, and that'll take you to the live website. And on Tuesday night, from on the second Tuesday and the fourth Tuesday of the month, live show here at the Blog Talk Word of the Lord radio show. And that's on the second Tuesday of the month, we have a guest speaker from the Brotherhood of the Churches of Christ. We'll be making that proclamation of the gospel of Christ. And also, during that show, we have a community corner segment for small business owners and entrepreneurs who will be making uh, who will have products and services for our community. I have three co-hosts on that show. Lou Gibby is the evangelist for the Broke Park Church of Christ there in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Isa Mullins, he serves as the Church of Christ there in Cary, North Carolina. Then on the fourth Tuesday of the month, at 7 p.m. from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. My co-host Kelly Fletcher, she served the Livingstone Church of Christ there in Indianapolis, Indiana. She has the Kelly Fletcher Show. Then on Thursday evening, each week from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'll be hosting the live show, the Gospel Light Radio Show. I have eight co-hosts on this show. We'll be making their, we'll be presenting lessons from the Word of God. And each week I have two co-hosts on the air with me. Also taking a question from my social media platform on Facebook. Shout it out. I'll be posting to one of my co-hosts on that live show. Then on Friday night, I'll be hosting a live show and to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 to 10 p.m. Central Standard Time. I'll be hosting Stevie B. Acapella Gospel Music Blast Radio Show. And on that show, I'll be playing some of the world's greatest acapella gospel artists. A sweet of on this Friday night, there will not be a show. On this Friday night, due to the concert this weekend in Atlanta, Georgia, this is a part. This is part of the Experience Acapella tour that I'm on. And also, we have the on-demand episodes, the variety of musical platforms. Wherever you're getting your podcast from, you can listen to these uh, past shows that we have here. There are over 700 episodes on those platforms. You can go to Spotify, Radio, Amazon Music, Apple iTunes, YouTube, just the. We also want to thank our sponsors who are sponsoring these radio shows. If you want to be a sponsor, just contact my sponsorship manager, Michelle Mark, Bell, Florida. The telephone number is 954-667-4705. And the three E's of Stevie B Media Production is the objective of this broadcast. We want to educate, we want to edify, we want to encourage you in the study of God's Word. And that will conclude our program announcements. You're listening to the Gospel Live Radio Show. My co-host, Dr. Frank Washington, the next after the break. Don't you worry. 
You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Give your attention to the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now my co-host, Dr. Frank Washington, and his subject, When Kingdoms Collide, God and Governments. Thank you, Brother Stevie. I appreciate your uh, allowing me to express my faith in Jesus Christ and uh, allowing me to... uh, be one of the guest speakers on your uh, great program here. Uh, I won't be long, but as Christians, we are not to feel as uh, if we are not bound by the law and authority of earthly government because we are citizens of another kingdom. Instead, we should demonstrate our respect for the heavenly king by being subject to earthly authority. This lesson is taken from Mark chapter 12, 14 through 17, and this lesson uh, was going to take a look at tonight at what it means to live in the world without being of the world. This lesson tonight is going to address what it means to give to Caesar, or in my case, give to Florida what belongs to Florida, and to give to God what belongs to God. I hope you have time for this. If you are serious about following Jesus and living for God, then you and I are going to struggle to rest between living in the world but not being of the world, John seventeen fourteen through 19. You and I will encounter distress, and conflict within ourselves in several arenas in our environment. Uh, We will find this in the area of entertainment, uh, the movies that we watch and shows 
that promote lifestyles that you and I disagree with or music uh, that we don't agree with. We'll find distress or tension in the area of politics that deals with abortion uh, or politics trying to reshape the definition of marriage or the area of government supporting a government that supports things that uh, you and I as Christians do not uh, agree with. The takeaway of this is, as followers of Jesus, you and I are going to have this stress, this constriction, this uh, tension between living for God while working and living in an ungodly world. Now, I just want to stop by today to tell you that this is normal, so don't worry. I'm going to give you the answers on how to handle this in just a minute. Jesus said in John 3.16 that God loved the world so much that he sent his uh, one and only son so that they could have eternal life. Now, what that tells me is that God loves this fallen, this broken, this sinful world, this fallen world. This fallen world, however, doesn't bring joy to God. But God still loves this world. And in Romans 5 and 8, we're told that God showed uh, his great love for us by sending Christ, Jesus Christ, to die for us while uh, we were still sinners. Now, what that tells me is God loved me while I was sinning against him. I hadn't placed my faith in him, my trust in him, or believed in him for salvation or anything, but he still loved me then. So my question, do you love the people of this world even though they sin against God and you? Do you love the people of this world even though uh, they don't believe what you believe about God and his word? Do you believe the people of this world who live alternative lifestyles, homosexuality and all that other stuff that you disagree with? Do you love the people of this world that would consider Uh, uh, are selfish, greedy, and worldly? Or do you come across as someone who hates them, who wishes they would just disappear and go somewhere else? Well, if you're going to follow Jesus, then Jesus has to make you a friend of sin. Stay with me now. Your test and your struggle is your story. Now, James chapter 1 and verse 2 says, When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. My friends, in life, you are going to have troubles. If you're not having troubles, then you're not doing anything. Anybody here other than me have troubles, trouble in your marriage, trouble in your finances, trouble at work, trouble with your health, trouble with your car, I mean, trouble with your kids, trouble with your in-laws, trouble, trouble all over the place, trouble at school. James says, when trouble of any kind comes your way and my way, that is when your faith and my faith is being tested. Then a few verses later, James goes on to say in uh, chapter 1 and verse 12, God blesses those who patiently endure testing. Many of these uh, troubles are not over quickly. They linger. They last weeks, months, sometimes years. As you patiently endure these tests, God blesses you. You didn't know that, did you? As you patiently endure these tests, God blesses us through them. We become stronger. We become wiser. We become more compassionate and loving towards others. At least that's what we should be. We become more understanding. You you and I grow spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. God blesses us, and I'm thankful for that. We begin to see, and you begin to see, that your test is becoming your testimony. Your mess, so to speak, is developing into your message. Now, Peter would add some insight to our testing in 1 Peter 1, verse 7, when he says, 
So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Uh, These trials will show that your faith is genuine, and it is being tested as fire tests the purified gold. Now, you don't know that kind of faith if uh, if if you have until you are tested by troubles and trials, you don't know uh, what kind of faith you have until you are troubles and trials and crisis that come into your life. When you go through a trial, that's when you get an opportunity to show that your faith is genuine, that your faith is real and authentic. When you face a financial disaster, you know, you lose your job. You, you have an opportunity to display that faith, what faith really looks like. When you face a serious illness, you, you are given the opportunity to demonstrate to others uh, what authentic faith looks like. When you live in a country that continues to move further and further and further away from God, you're given an opportunity, my friend, to demonstrate and reveal God is worthy to follow, trust, and obey. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and visitors, your test is your testimony. Your mess is your message, and your struggle is your story. Tonight we're going to see Jesus tested. He's going to be uh, or going to use this test to teach a lesson. Jesus is going to try to be trapped or, or going to be asked a trapped question about supporting an ungodly government and living a godly life. So let's engage in a fireside chat and take a look and see what we can learn. So in our, in our lesson, in Mark chapter 12, uh, if you got your Bibles, go with me, Mark chapter 12, verse number 14. Uh, later, the leaders sent some Pharisees and supporters of Herod to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You are impartial and don't play favorites. You teach the way of God truthfully. Are they buttering him up now? Even though they were using flattery to set up Jesus, what they said about Jesus was absolutely 100% true. Jesus was honest. He was impartial. He didn't play favorites. He taught the way of God truthfully. And those should be characteristics of you and I as well. But then Mark goes on to say, now tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or shouldn't we? Jesus saw through the hypocrisy and said, why are you trying to trap me or test me? Show me a Roman coin and I'll tell you. When they handed it to him, he asked, whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well then, Jesus said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. And his reply completely amazed them. It wowed them. Here's why. The Pharisees and Herodians asked Jesus a question beginning in verse 14. Now tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not pay them? Why would they ask that question? Well, how does that trap Jesus? You have to understand the tax they were referring to and the specific coin used to pay this tax. Now, the taxes to Caesar is referring to the poll tax, and this tax is based on the head count of the entire Roman Empire. Everyone had to pay, pay it. Everybody in the Roman Empire had to pay this tax. This tax helped pay for the infrastructure uh, of the empire, meaning it had to pay for the roads, the security, uh, the salaries. It, it had to pay for the officials. It'd be like the taxes that, you know, you and I pay for road imp- improvement, and I do hope you all are paying your taxes. Um, it paid for the road improvement, police, schools, stuff like that. Every government has to have money to run the country, including Rome at that time. The tax helped Rome the mighty Rome with his armies and expansion and their commitment to all the pagan gods and goddesses throughout the empire. Now, the Israelites, however, struggled with the same thing a lot of Christians struggle with today. 
when they paid their tax, they knew that some of the money went to things they did not approve of morally, politically, ethically. So their stress with this was multiplied a hundred times over because they lived in a country where idol worship and paganism was the driving religion and part of their and part of their day. Paganism was a government approved religion. You didn't walk down Main Street and see a you know, Baptist church or Catholic church or a Methodist church or a COC. You, know, you would see massive temples where people gathered to worship this god, small g, or goddess, small g. Many of these temples offered sacrifices and had temple prostitutes as part of their various acts of worship. Now, you and I are required to pay this poll tax to demonstrate that you support the Roman Empire and the current Caesar. The Roman coin that Jesus is, is referring to is the official coin that everyone had to use to pay this tax. This coin, this particular coin, was minted under the authority of the emperor and equaled about a day's salary for a Roman soldier or uh, a common labor, a laborer. But during Jesus' day, this coin would have had the image of Tiberius Caesar, who was the son of the Emperor Augustus, who had been officially, you know, uh, defied as as a god or defied as a god. But ironically, what you have here is a coin with the image of Tiberius, who is believed to be the son of a small G-O-D. Now, the inscription on the coin would have read Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of divine Augustus. Now, the true son of God was about to use this coin to make a major statement. Now, watch this. Because of this image, the message on the coin, the Israelites and the religious leaders considered the coins to be miniature idols. You follow me? Now, in their view, carrying them was a violation of the second commandment where you are told to have no idols. Do I need to repeat that? Let me do it anyway. Because of the image on that coin, because of that image and message Israelites and the religious leaders of that time considered the coins to be miniature idols. And, 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 in, and in their POV, carrying them was a violation of the second commandment where you were told you were to have no idols. All right? Now, There are a lot of debates and arguments over the poll tax and the coin used between Rome and the Israelites. Rome believed in many gods, and the Israelites believed in one god. The Pharisees represented one side, and the Herodians represented the other. These two groups came to Jesus and asked him, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Are these Christians supposed to pay taxes? Should they pay them, or should they not? So we're told in verse 15, Jesus saw through their hypocrisy. And he said, why are you trying to trap me? Jesus knew what these boys are up to. He knew their game, even before they opened their mouth. But he said, show me a Roman coin and I'll tell you. Jesus knew that this was a trap. So how is it a trap? Well, since Jesus understood human nature in John chapter 2 and verse number 25, he saw through their hip and saw through the trick or the game that they were about to play. He knew their evil motive. So he rhetorically asked the question, why are you trying to trap me? He knew the answer. Jesus knew it was a trap. He knew why they were trying to trap him, but Jesus was ready. But how is this a trap, Doc? Well, these folk are expecting Jesus to answer the question in one of two ways, and here shows the power of Jesus. If Jesus said, no, you should not pay the tax, This would be equivalent of Jesus denying Roman authority and denouncing Augustus as a god. Mm -hmm. That answer would put Jesus in the category of a traitor and committing treason. The Herodians then could have Jesus arrested, placed in prison, and eventually executed. Contrast to that, the opposite side of that is if Jesus said, yes, you should pay the tax, then this would make the Israelites angry and disappointed with Jesus, and many people would abandon him forever. Now, his popularity would decrease overnight if he said yes. Many of them were expecting him to 
be the Messiah who overthrows the Roman government. They were not thinking of Jesus as a Messiah who overthrows sin. And at this point, the people were seeing Jesus as a political Messiah and not a spiritual Messiah. So what do we have here? Jesus asked for a Roman coin, and this brings us to verse 16. He says, when they handed it to him, he asked, whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Verse 17, well then, Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, or whatever state you're in, give to Florida what belongs to Florida, or give to Texas what belongs to Texas, or give to North Carolina what belongs to North Carolina, blah, blah, blah. And give to God what belongs to God. And this reply uh, completely amazed them. Now, I hope you all are still on the line, because here we, we're, we're getting to it now. To understand what Jesus is saying and to understand what it means to us today, let's, let's take Jesus' statement, divide it in half, and examine each part. So, first, Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Jesus begins this statement with the word give. Now, this word in the Greek means to pay back a debt or to simply pay something back. Now, Jesus looked at taxes as a citizen's debt to the government in return for the services that they performed. And the taxes in Jesus' day went to support the army, which provided safety and security to the people. And the taxes went to build roads and all those other things that taxes go to. Today, for you and I, or you and me, our taxes support fire, police protection, public education, national defense transportation, special programs for the poor, the underprivileged, on and on and on. It helps with salaries and all that other kind of stuff. As a Christian citizen, you might not agree with the way all of your tax money is used. I, I, I sure don't. And you can express yourself with your voice and your vote, but you must accept the fact that God has established human government for our good, Romans 13, 1. But then Jesus asked whose picture and title is stamped on the coin. And the word picture is best described as or translated as image. So basically he's saying whose image is on that coin. Since Caesar's image is on the coin and Caesar represents the government, then give to Caesar Give to Caesar that belongs to Caesar. Pay your taxes. Live under his authority. Live by the laws of the land. Pay back to the government what you've been using from the government all year. This is Jesus' way of saying submit to the government. You follow me? Submit to the government. Now, then Jesus says, underline this, and give Underline that word give to God what belongs to God. Now, Jesus begins this phrase with the same word give as he did on the verse above. But again, this particular word means to pay back. It means to pay back. God has given you and I air to breathe, a mind to think, heart to feel a life to live. Jesus says, give back to God belongs to God. And Jesus is talking about ownership. The Roman coin was Caesar's because it bore his image. So give it back to Caesar. You you, you, You and I, however, bear the image of God. So give yourself, myself, give ourselves back to God. Genesis 127. Jesus is saying here, Go ahead and support your government, but live for God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? Go ahead and support your government, people, but live for God. Now, this statement by Jesus also did something else. By saying give to God what belongs to God, Jesus was rejecting August as a God, as it was stated on the coin. Jesus was saying there is only one God, and guess what? Augustus certainly ain't it. Amen? Jesus knows what he's doing. He knows 
we live in a fallen. He knows we live in a broken world. He, know, we, he knows that we live in a sinful world. And, and, and sinful world, you are going to live under the authority of governments that are fallen, broken, and sinful. But Jesus said, in spite of all that, in spite of all that brokenness, in spite of all that sinfulness, in spite of, you know, things going crazy the way they are, Jesus says, in spite of all that, be a good citizen. Pay your taxes, but give your life to God. Be a good citizen. Pay your taxes, but give your life to God. So Jesus' answer here is so simple and yet so profound that his reply completely amazed him. And I'm sure it probably completely amazes most of you who are listening right now. In summation, Jesus is showing you and I, you and me, what it looks like to follow him by being in the world without being of the world. To Caesar, what belongs to Caesar? Give to the world what belongs to the world. But my friends, give to God what belongs to God. Give yourself to God and live for Him. I hope this lesson helped you. I hope it uh, gives you the understanding of give to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar, pay your taxes. Go out and vote uh, and live for God. Support your government, uh, but live for God. Amen. I hope this lesson helped, and I hope you use this lesson uh, to heart, and I want you to stay uh, in God's grip. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. hurting all alone I was searching for a comfort I could find on my own with no direction feeling down my life was headed for disaster do you turn me around Nothing ever had been able to ease me When trying to please me It only pleased me less But when I learned about the way that you love me Had to put your honor above me And you gave me rest Lead me to rest, sweet Lord As I consider what you offered me, how can it be real? What should I offer in return? When the value of your blessings no one could ever, ever earn. Then you tell me that I'm really forgiven. Got a reason for And you made it so clear, yeah. I'm supported when the devil would charm me. Protected when the evil would harm me. Tell me how can I feel? Lead me to rest, sweet Lord. Lead me to rest. From my journey here, lead me to rest.
You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our show. I want to thank you for tuning into our radio broadcast this evening. We certainly appreciate those who've been following our radio show on Blog Talk Radio, as well as those on social media, Facebook Live. I want to thank both of my co-hosts, uh, Dr. Frank Washington and Courtney Carruthers, who did a, did a great job in their lesson. They always do a great job in their proclamation of the gospel of Christ. I do, really do appreciate these gentlemen. I don't take any of this for granted. These men are putting forth some serious effort here in making their proclamation of the gospel of Christ, and I certainly appreciate it. Also, certainly appreciate Clay Phillips for answering that question. That was a, a, a very deep question that was asked. A lot of uh, different aspects of the Holy Spirit that was being asked about, and Brother Clay always does a great job and answering those questions. That brother just loves to preach. All the men on this show just love to preach the gospel, and I certainly appreciate them. I don't take any of this for granted, ladies and gentlemen. We are just so thrilled to be able to bring you a weekly broadcast. It is our prayer that the lessons that we're given on this radio show have been beneficial to your spiritual lives, and your relationship with the Lord has been strengthened because you're not only tuning in this radio show, but you've given yourself over to a study of God's Word. I'm your host, Stevie R. Butler, and I want to say on behalf of all of my co-hosts here on the Gospel Light Radio Show, we really do appreciate your love and support for these programs. Good night, everybody. God bless you. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show.
You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show.